So here's the fundamental problem I want to use to motivate the introduction of complex numbers. I'm going to set it up, and then we're going to backpedal a bit to simpler equations um, so that we can actually figure out. Oh, we don't need that little ladybug, do we? We can actually figure out how to guess the, uh, the solution in the real case. So here's the picture I started with. We've got a mass on a spring, a certain spring constant. And then there's going to be some sort of damping. Um, again, very roughly, you can think of it as friction. Uh, it's more like if you've got like a shock absorber, sometimes they that's put into some sort of um, medium that provides some damping. Uh, it's called a dash pot sometimes. So, uh, but if you think about it as friction, it's not going to it's not going to kill you. Okay. So, what's the spring? Well, the force of the spring in this approximation, and it's not a bad approximation a lot of the times, is that it's opposite to the position. Oh, let, me, let me make that clearer. Let's say this is y equals 0. And y measures the displacement from y equals 0 being the equilibrium position. There's some position that the spring wants to have and where there's going to be no force. And if you pull it away, you're going to get a force that's, um, if y is positive, that force is going to be negative. If y is negative, it's positive. It's a restoring force. Okay, And that's called Hooke's Law. Very basic physics. Okay, um, And then we've also got a damping force. And again, to make it uh, simple mathematically, we're going to use a particularly simple kind of damping force, which is that it depends, I think I'll write my y's that way, on how fast the object is going. And again, it's just proportional. It's a linear force. It depends just proportionally on the velocity. And again, it's going to be negative. So if it's going to the right, the force will pull it to the left and vice versa. So C and K and C are going to be positive constants, and we're putting in the negatives explicitly. And so that's a linear damping. Okay. So, and then of course we combine that with F equals MA. Well, that's M times the second derivative of Y. Okay, and that's going to be the sum of these forces. That's the beautiful thing about Newtonian mechanics is that forces add. It's a linearity principle. And I'm going to put everything on one side. So there we have it. It's a differential equation in y of t, this one function. It's an ordinary differential equation because there's no partial derivatives or anything. It's second order. It's linear, so I don't have like y squares or y prime times y or cosine of y or anything like that. And it's got constant coefficients. The mass, the spring constant, and the damping constant are not changing in time, and they don't depend on the position. So this is a very good place to start. Um, understanding differential equations, linear constant coefficient, second order differential equation. Okay, and it turns out that's going. What's this is what's going to force us to uh, invent complex numbers. It more or less forces us. Um, you get to a point where we would be truly perverse not to accept that complex numbers are truly amazingly useful. Okay, so um, oh, to make it a little bit more specific, um, we need initial conditions. This is not going to have a unique solution. And it's OK. We could look at the general solution. But um, we want to have some initial conditions. And later on, what I'll focus on is, let's say, at time 0, we pull it one unit away from equilibrium. And I need to know more than that for equal, uh, initial conditions. For a second order differential equation, it turns out I need two initial conditions. Basically, there's sort of two integrations going on, even though I won't actually need to do any integrations. I'm going to be able to do this just by educated guessing. But basically, there's two integrations that happen two arbitrary constants, so you need two conditions to solve for those constants. And, and here's the other condition. I'm just going to release it from rest. The velocity at time zero is going to be zero. And this makes sense physically. You need to tell me where a particle is or an object is and how fast it's going before Newton's laws can actually predict the future because Newton's laws are second order. OK, so that's going to be our core problem, but we're not ready to do that yet. We will instead first do, I've got to figure out a way to not have these bleed through. I guess I could not use a Sharpie. 
but Sharpies are pretty good otherwise. Um, here's our first problem. Y prime equals lambda Y. And I'm going to use lambda because it ties in with some really great uses of the Greek letter lambda. Um, and y of 0 equals 1, to make it very explicit. Okay. So, if you're following along on the PDF, this is where we actually transition to stuff that you should do yourself. Okay, so this is a great time to um, look up that PDF. I'll try to make sure to put another link in the comments or on the in an annotation. Um, and start trying to do this as much as possible yourself, if you really want to learn this. Okay, so here lambda is some real number. It's a fixed real number. Could be 7, 2, minus 5, could be 1. If it's 0, it's going to be special and it's kind of stupid. Um, and this is the most important differential equation in the whole world. P constant proportional rate of growth. The rate of growth of, of a quantity is proportional to that quantity. Um, population growth, simple model of population growth, radioactive decay, all kinds of good stuff. Okay, so first question is, what's the solution? And this is something if you have taken a little bit of calculus, you really should know, and not that you know there's a procedure or some sort of technique, it's just we know the answer. It's such an important function that we know the answer to this problem. So pause it if you haven't already figured it out. It's an exponential, e to the lambda t. That's the whole point about exponentials, is that when you take the derivative, it's itself, and then the lambda comes through from the chain rule. So any exponential no matter what base and what I put in as a factor here, it's going to be have a derivative that's proportional to itself. And this, conveniently enough, satisfies this initial condition already. Okay, So exponential either growth or decay. And that's for lambda greater than 0 and lambda less than 0. And that's um, what the solution is. Okay, so um, we're going to... I'm not going to be focused a lot on rigor here, but in a little bit we're going to want to generalize things to complex numbers and generalize the exponential to complex numbers. So we might want to think just think back just a little bit to what is the actual definition of this guy? It's something that's kind of uh, very much glossed over in, in a lot of first-year calculus courses. But toward the end of a first-year calculus course, you learn that there is a power series for this function. And one of the nice things about power series is they seem kind of scary when you first do calculus, but they're a really great way to be absolutely sure you've actually defined a function at all. And e to the x has a very nice power series. It's the sum of x to the k over k factorial. Or in other words, it's 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 dot dot dot. And in a lot of courses, uh, you know, first-year calculus courses, you get a lot of stuff, technical kind of finicky stuff about radius of convergence and this test and that test. And the basic punchline for this series is that none of that stuff gives you any trouble whatsoever. All of the things that could go wrong with a series of numbers or a power series never go wrong with this function. It's wonderful. All the things that you'd like to be true about this are, are, are true. And we're going to definitely make use of that later when we make the somewhat ambitious leap to putting complex numbers into here. Okay. Um, so, this was rather special. That y of 0 was exactly the number 1. Okay. What about if you had a slightly more general problem? Some number why not? And I want to get the solution of the same differential equation but with a different constant. Okay. Now, in general, for more complicated differential equations than this, th these might be qualitatively different. That the behavior for one initial condition could be very, very different from the behavior for another, another initial condition. And just because we were able to guess this one for this problem, I couldn't necessarily guess for here. But this is not just a random differential equation. So think about it for a second. I think it's, this is an easy one still. It's just going to be the same function multiplied by y naught. And why does that work? It's because multiplying by a constant, that is respected by differentiation, and it's certainly respected by multiplying by lambda over here. The fundamental principle is that this is a linear differential equation. So I can multiply 
this so solution by any number and it's still going to work. That's a big deal. Linear differential equations are much simpler than nonlinear ones. Okay. So, question D. Okay, back after a brief pause. Uh, the rule is if you're making a YouTube video and you get a call, you should not answer it unless it's from your mother. And it was from my mother, so I had to answer it. Um, so here's a question. We want to look at the qualitative behavior of all these solutions we get and especially think about like the physical significance. So let's assume lambda is not equal to zero, so it's really an exponential. And why not? It's not equal to zero, so it's not just the zero function. Well, is y of t bounded, for example? Most of the time, not, not all the time, but most of the time, we'd like our functions to be bounded. Well, if we insist on y of t being bounded in both directions, as t goes to minus infinity and plus infinity, then no. Remember, if lambda is greater than zero, lambda is less than zero, it looks like this. Neither of these guys is fully bounded completely. Um, and, but they are bounded in one direction. This is bounded in the past, this is bounded in the future. So there's kind of a halfway boundedness. So that's interesting. It might not seem incredibly interesting right now, but it'll be a good comparison to, to later cases. Okay. Um, and the, you know, the basic thing is exponentials, seem, they, they grow and decay um, in one direction, backwards or forward, depending on which lamb, what sign lambda is. They do constant growth, 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 growth. And that's going to be of interest, a very interesting contrast to what we get later on. Um, okay, and then last bit of this problem is um, y prime equals lambda y, um, and y of 0 equals 1. Back to our standard problem, so of course y of t equals e to the lambda t. Um, and this, the one just simplifies thing, what I'm going to say, okay? And the question is, is there a simple relationship between y at one time y at another time, and y at the sum of those two times. Well, what are those? They're e to the t1, e to the t2, and e to the t, oh, sorry, lambda t1, lambda t2, and lambda t1 plus t2. Well, guess what? We know, from what we know about rules of exponents, is that the product of these guys is equal to this guy. There is an extremely simple relationship. between these three quantities. And so somehow the progression of time, if you wait for t1 or, and then wait for an additional time t2, then that gives you, gets you to here. Well, it's the same thing as doing this growth factor, e to the t1, e to the lambda t1, and then this growth factor. That's a beautiful thing about this equation. And again, it's going to be an interesting comparison to later cases where we're going to at first think that this beautiful, beautiful relationship won't hold, and then maybe we might be able to recover. And we'll continue in the next one.